Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Tony Payan. I'm the director of the Center for the United States and Mexico at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy. I want to welcome you to this uh, webinar today on Mexico's power sector. Recently, I read a text, it's a brief book titled Understanding Institutional Weakness by Branks Levitsky and Murillo. In it, the authors present a very good theoretical framework to understand institutional weakness in a society. Among several variables that lead a country to fail are a rapid institutional change that fails to allow enough time for new laws and regulations to mature and render fruit before making any additional changes. They also point to a government's unwillingness to implement the law, and of course that means fulfilling their commitments uh, to citizens, investors, and society at large. All this creates great, a great deal of uncertainty, and of course this results in detriment of economic growth. Such, I think, is the case with Mexico's power sector today. We saw some changes to the power sector a few years ago, about 12, 13 years ago, and then we saw a few more in 2014, all in the direction of a more liberal power or liberalized power sector. Uh, of course, now we see President Lopez Obrador and his administration reverse those changes in favor of closing the sector to any additional investment. And of course, uh, 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 taking the opportunity and the, the uh, to reverse some of that, to, to implement a counter reform to those changes made then, and this is creating great waves in the power sector in Mexico. And we don't know what's going to happen in the future. For now, the so-called electricity industry law is mired in the judicial system, where it has been stuck for the past few weeks, waiting for a final, uh, uh, I, I guess, a final uh, deliver, uh, final court a decision on the status, the legality, and the constitutionality, rather, of the uh, law. Uh, so here we are discussing this important topic again, and we have a great panel of experts today to discuss where this law stands today, where we are going. Uh, to lead this panel, we have invited uh, Francisco Monaldi, who is, of course, our Latin America Energy Fellow at the Baker Institute, and of course, we we'll rely on, on uh, his enormous expertise. He's got an extensive curriculum. I will not go into it today. You can find it on our website and the program uh, for this particular panel. And so I'll leave the microphone to uh, Francisco Monaldi uh, uh, now so he can lead us in this important conversation with uh, our experts. Francisco, the microphone is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Tony. It is a pleasure uh, to be the moderator of this uh, great panel uh, that we have today with three of our non-resident uh, uh, fellows and uh, uh, an expert from the Instituto Mexicano de Competitividad, the Mexican Competitive Institute, which is a think tank that is sponsoring this event uh, uh, with us. And we're very happy to collaborate uh, with them. So as Tony mentioned, uh, the new electricity law, which is the subject of our uh, panel, uh, reverses some of the key elements of the energy reform that was approved by the previous administration, uh, giving more power uh, to the state-owned electricity company, the CFE, uh, and prioritizing the power dispatch at the expense, the, the power dispatch of the CFE at the expense of uh, uh, its private uh, competitors. Uh, giving also regulators more significant powers to uh, revise uh, uh, contracts. So these are, you know, important elements. And he mentioned that the, the, this is in review in the, in the courts. For now, the application of the law uh, is suspended. Uh, but this and the very recently introduced bill uh, last week, uh, the, high, the new hydrocarbons uh, bill that basically uh, reforms uh, also the, the midstream and downstream parts of the of the hydrocarbons uh, uh, reform. It, it clearly show the intention of President Lopez Obrador that has of course been clear from the very beginning, but that uh, he really is uh, uh, pushing for to give more power to the two state owned enterprise that used to be uh, the monopolies uh, reigning the Mexican energy sector. 
Um, and in fact, he has uh, signaled that in case um, the courts impede the implementation of he, these legal changes, he might be interested in pursuing a constitutional change, uh, which of course will significantly hinge on what happens on the midterm elections in Mexico in June uh, of uh, this uh, uh, year. So to discuss the topic, we have, uh, as I said, this uh, great panel. Uh, and I ask the panelists to please put their uh, uh, cameras on. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Miriam Grunstein, who uh, is a non-resident uh, scholar of the Baker Institute uh, uh, Center for the United States and Mexico. And she's the Chief Energy Council of Brilliant Energy Consulting. She's, as uh, probably most of you know, uh, one of the most recognized energy consultants in Mexico, and she has been writing uh, very interesting uh, uh, briefs on, on, on the energy issues of Mexico uh, for the Baker Institute and for other um, uh, outlets. Dr. Luther Melgar, also an unresident fellow at the Baker Center for Energy Studies, um, Institute Center for Energy Studies, is of course the former Deputy Secretary of Energy uh, in Mexico both on the electricity side when the reform, uh, constitutional reform was passed and later in the hydrocarbons, uh, uh, on the hydrocarbon side of the Secretary of, of, of Energy. And, and in that position, she um, uh, was in the boards of both uh, Pemex and, and, and CFE in, you know, in, in each uh, respective time. Uh, so she has, uh, a, uh, of course, a, uh, a very uh, uh, significant, uh, uh, you know, had a very significant role in the implementation of the energy reform. And of course that uh, provides a, a, a very interesting view of what's happening today. And she's of course also a, a, an, an academic that has uh, worked on these, uh, on these issues. So has the capacity to both, uh, you know, reflect as a policymaker, as an, an academic. We have also uh, Oscar Ocampo, uh, as I mentioned, he uh, uh, comes to us from the Instituto Mexicano de la, para la Competitividad, uh, which is a, a think tank specializing so, on, this, uh, on these issues. And he's the energy coordinator there and has been an advisor also to um, uh, members of the board of the, of the CFE in the, in the past. So uh, well uh, uh, knows this uh, sector pretty well. And finally, we have Professor Juan Rosellon, who is also a non-resident fellow uh, at the Baker Institute and a professor at the CIDE, the Centro de Investigación y Docencia Económica, one of the most respected uh, universities uh, in, in uh, Mexico, in which I am uh, honored to be a member of their external uh, committee. Um, so uh, with that, uh, let me start uh, with uh, some questions for some initial uh, interventions by our, our participants. So we will start with uh, Lourdes. So Lourdes, uh, can you give us uh, a brief overview of what the 2013 energy reform, the, the one that you were involved with, uh, uh, what were the characteristics and what was the, uh, and put that into context of the current debate uh, of the energy policy in Mexico? Thank you, Lourdes. Sure, um, thank you very much, uh, Francisco. Good morning, everyone. I would like to thank the Baker Institute for inviting me to participate in this panel and share the floor with great colleagues. So I think it's important indeed to uh, think back about what happened with the 2013 constitutional reform. And the first thing I would like to recall is that changing, uh, opening up the constitution for uh, reforming the energy sector in Mexico is akin to trying to change the second amendment in the United States. Since 1938, oil and therefore energy was equated to national sovereignty. Um, the Peña, Pe, during the campaign, Peña Nieto promised that he would uh, lower electricity rates through an energy reform. And basically at the time he meant solely a hydrocarbons reform, but there was no way that um, electricity rates could be lowered by only substituting fuels in electricity generation. Uh, part of the problem was that the 1992 legal opening to private investment had created a distorted system. There were IPPs with PPAs uh, with CFE to bring investment and uh, new technology for um, the use of CFE. There, were, uh, private uh, there was a private electricity market for private uh, 
uh, large consumers that had access to cheaper and cleaner uh, electricity. And CFT was losing all the major consumers who were actually the ones that paid the electricity bill and could no longer uh, lower rates without increasing subsidies. Electricity rates by 2012 were on average 25% higher than in the US and that was uh, including subsidies, which of course was affecting Mexico competitiveness. So what was this electricity reform about? Basically, it meant to provide cheaper and cleaner electricity with transparent and equal rules of the game. Transmission and distribution stayed in the hands of the state and that is of CFE. Planning and operation of the electricity system also stayed in the hands of the state. An independent system operator, Senase, was established and there was a strong regulatory commission, the Energy Regulatory Commission, to oversee the electricity uh, sector industry. Also, we created a wholesale power market with an economic dispatch, and only generation and commercialization was opened up to private participation on an equal footing with CFE. It's important to stress that the private, part the private participation was allowed, but there was no privatization of state assets. Um, also, at the constitutional level, clean energy certificates were established to comply with Mexico's climate change law, as well with the energy transition law, which uh, actually established a target of producing 35% of its energy, uh, its electricity with clean sources by 2024, and, and boost the deployment of renewables. It established auctions and CFE had to acquire its electricity through auctions to ensure dispatch of the cheapest electricity. CFE was also granted control of its fuel policy before the reform it was subject to Pemex needs. Social and environmental obligations were included at the constitutional level and also at the legal level. The basic idea was to ensure that Mexico could have a strong CFE and private participants to provide energy security, accelerate the energy transition and create greater competitiveness for the Mexican economy with sustainability, transparency and rule of law. The model was successful in attracting investments in the power sector, running auctions, particularly in the clean energies or in renewable energies where we got really competitive electricity rates and allow CFE to take control of its fuel policy, which actually CFE became a key player in the natural gas market. So what's the situation? Well, today, the name of the game is energy sovereignty, which is based on the belief that oil production, refining, consumption by Pemex is the motor of the Mexican economy, and that CFE has to be the sole player in the electricity sector. So we're going from uh, beginning a liberalized market to two monopolies again. As you can see, there are two contending views of how the energy sector should be structured. And the de debate is basically going on with the proposed laws that President Lopez Obrador has presented first in uh, the electricity sector and now on the hydrocarbon side. Thank you, Lourdes. Uh, so let me move on to, to Juan. Uh, Juan has carried out uh, a significant academic work on the issues related to the economic foundations of that energy a reform of 2013. In fact, you can access some of his work in uh, our uh, webpage uh, and the Center for Energy Studies uh, webpage at the Baker Institute. So Juan, can you uh, please share with us uh, uh, your perspective on uh, uh, from this research on the insights that this research brought? Thank you, Francisco, and thank you very much to the Baker Institute for the invitation. Um, I would like to start to, by pointing out that from a market architecture perspective, the 2013 reform to the electricity, uh, electricity sector in Mexico was a, a partial one. So Lourdes has already described very well all of the ingredients of this reform. And yet, you know, for some years now, we have been doing some academic work on the reform. And I would like to uh, summarize uh, around let's say eight scientific publications on the economic uh, rationality of, of the reform. Uh, these uh, papers have been published in international and national peer-reviewed of field journals such as Energy Journal, Energy Policy and Utilities Policy. So let me make a, a brief list of the results that we have obtained. 
So, for example, in a 2019 investigación económica paper, uh, paper investigación económica is a national top economics journal, uh, we modeled the CFE's generation cost function, and we found that it made sense that CFE concentrated in operation and maintenance of large plants above 1500 megawatts, such as nuclear hydro coal plants, due to increasing returns in this type of plants. But that it made sense that a smaller scale renewable generation or even combined cycle generation be developed by other type of investors due to the structure of the electricity sector compared to the rest of the economy and under various scenarios of development of the gas prices in North America. So these last two uh, results, we obtained them in a couple of energy policy uh, publica publications. Now, we also did some work on analyzing the um, planning of the expansion of the transmission network, uh, the PRODESEN, which is the, the, the acronym for, for this planning. And in a 2017 energy policy paper, we found that it actually uh, converged, uh, the, I mean, the, the way it was designed led to the network to converge to welfare optimal expansion because it combined a couple of planning procedures, one for generation and another for expansion with a plexus and a power flow models. Uh, that's how the SENER and the SENASA carried out the, uh, uh, the planning, the PRODESEN. But however, we also found that much more investment in transmission was needed to provide enough transmission capacity to fully integrate new renewable energy from auctions. Another important thing that we analyzed in the 2017 Energy Journal paper was uh, the issue of nodal pricing, which is, a, uh, you know, is also a feature that is not sometimes talked about much, but it was a, a, a very important thing that was implemented with the reform. So nodal pricing based on merit order dispatch and FDRs are an important element to provide correct economic signals to the system and lead to allocative and distributive efficient electricity tariffs. So we studied that, as I said, in an energy journal paper, but talking about electricity tariffs in uh, 2021, we, we just uh, are, have a, a paper in our revised and resubmitted status at the energy journal where we study the regressiveness of electricity tariffs and find uh, or propose there uh, the, 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 an, a new subsidy um, scheme that could be uh, done in order to lead to progressive subsidies, as well as to develop uh, solar PV photovoltaic distributed generation. And finally, in a 2017 energy policy paper, uh, we studied the enormous potential for the development of PV distributed generation in Mexico at the residential level. And uh, we found that this uh, type of planning of uh, having a much more, um, you know, rooftop solar PV generation in Mexico would lead to social welfare gains, including gains in consumer surplus, reductions in emissions, uh, and of course, savings in government subsidies. So this is a brief list of, of, of the uh, work we have done. Of course, you can check them as Francisco uh, mentioned in, in, the C, in my CES webpage. Um, and of course, if you have uh, interest in one of, the, uh, of these publications, I would be glad to, to send to anyone who is interested in, in any of these results. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juan. So let's move on to the actual what happened with the new law. And uh, for that, of course, our legal expert in this panel is, is Miriam. So uh, Miriam, can you tell us what are the key changes that the, the new electricity law uh, uh, incorporates, uh, please? Sure. Well, first of all, I must express my enthusiasm that this um, web webinar materialized. Um, it was an initiative that started when I was a visiting researcher at, at IMCO, and I was writing a paper that now, that now is absolutely obsolete, because the, my hypothesis is that, um, the, that the government would charge from the sphere of the administrative, meaning that the bureaucracy was going to be um, changing the legal system by way of administrative act. And that's the whole hypothesis of the of the paper. And now we have 
we the, the the president has gone beyond that it's not there are no longer administrative measures but actually he's gone to the legislative um ambit and has reformed the law so I, I i guess i'm going to throw my paper away or update it but the great thing about the paper is that i was as as i was in imco um we decided to approach tony and francisco and we have now this great webinar so not all things are lost i only have one obsolete paper that i need to update so um a few weeks ago um there was a, a, a surprising event at least surprising to me or not so surprising because of the president has been escalating um his his measures because he he escalates because he gets um, frustrated or angry because people do not comply with his wishes and he's a very willful man so he issued an agreement and the agreement faced many constitutional challenges and most of the challenges um generated injunctions so that 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 agreement is frozen in 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 the legal ambit in the legal sphere it has no effect so he became very irritated because that agreement was challenged before the courts. It actually reached the Supreme Court and it was killed then and there because the Supreme Court um, granted a definite injunction to the Antitrust Commission, which criticized the agreement because it violated uh, competition law in Mexico and there it went. So a few weeks later, the president announces, if you don't like my agreement, there goes my legal reform. So we were getting ready and there was a lot, a lot of tension and suspense. This is like a film. And then there it went. We saw the bill and boom, we saw it. The, 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 the Mexican, Mexican legal bills have a very a, a, a peculiarity. The, the discourse before the actual legal provisions that are the binding part is usually longer and more aggressive than the bill itself. Here we had a very, very long justification about um, getting back sovereignty and making CFE great again and, um, and all that very nationalistic discourse. And the provisions are brief, but they're very aggressive. So I'm going to mention the great constitutional don'ts because that's what's being reviewed in the courts. So number one, now CFE can enter into PPA contracts first and foremost with CFE. So the bid rounds in which um, CFE bought um, electricity in a competitive way is, is, is relegated. CFE can just choose um, to buy power to, from whomever it pleases. Number two, and this is not in the body of the law. This is in the justification document that I talked to you about that precedes the law. There, the, the dispatch model has been changed and in a very irrational way, which I, which I didn't really understand until Lourdes and I am, I'm putting the reflector in you Lourdes because she, she, she explained the political motives of this, of this dispatch model and, I, and I'd like her to speak her mind if she's willing because it's very interesting. Hydros from CFE come first and then we have other power generating facilities from CFE. Then we have um, then we have renewable generators, and then we have other power generations from private parties. So there is a kind of a misunderstanding in reading the law, and everybody went with the flow that this was an anti-renewable energy bill, but it's not. It's an anti-private sector bill. Because the renewables are there. I mean, hydroelectric plants could be said to be renewable, just that we don't have any water in Mexico, and that's the problem. And also, the gen, the hydroelectric facilities are very far away from the points of consumption. So I'd like to lure this to explain why hydros first, if she's willing, of course. I'm being mean. And then you have all the all all all, all the CFE generating facilities there. And this is why everybody went with the full flow and called the fuel oil initiative. But well, it's questionable. What is not questionable is that the government is, has a strong will to buy Pemex's fuel oil. What I wonder if whether it's viable because if during, during the Peña Nieto 
um, administration, fuel oil facilities, the thermals were, were converted into combined cycle facilities. So you may call it the fuel oil um, reform, but whether this is viable or not is another story. Then come the renewables and then come other facilities. And this involves independent power producers. And I'm sure they're very nervous. And in the 30 seconds I might have left, I'd like to say what I think is very dangerous about this bill, what really scares me, and it's hidden. In this thing called transitory articles, which are supposed to be the implementing steps of the law. And the fourth and the fifth um, transitory articles are very scary because they say, if some permits are deemed to be awarded in a legal way, we, re we, re we reserve the right to revise them and renegotiate or revoke them. And that is my biggest panic sphere. And with this, I would like to end my, my introductory remarks and thank you very much for being here. And I'm very happy this worked out. Thank you, Miriam. So um, uh, uh, the interesting uh, uh, observations. And uh, I think uh, that will lead us to a, an interesting discussion afterwards. Uh, Oscar, uh, can you uh, tell us how do you think this uh, uh, new law fits into the wider international commitments that Mexico has signed, in particular, of course, the USMCA, the Paris Agreement, and, and, and others? Thank you. Well, first of all, thanks to the Baker Institute and to Miriam, because the, the, this webinar was her idea, and I'm really happy that it materialized and that we're all sitting here this morning discussing the, the Mex Mexican power sector. And as Miriam uh, very accurately summarized, the, the new changes to the law, there, there is no way that they uh, are coherent with Mexico's international commitments both on the trade side with uh, the United States, Mexico's Canada agreement, NAFTA successor, uh, or CPTPP in the Asia Pacific, or even with the modernization of the Mexico European Union FTA, which is pending to be ratified. And on the other side, on, on the climate pillar of this, there, as, as Lourdes mentioned, uh, Mexico has a climate change law. It has an energy transition law that establishes that the country has to produce at least 35% of its electric generation by 2024 through clean sources. And in the end, this, uh, this bill or this new law, it makes it virtually impossible to comply with these objectives. And on the trade side, uh, the Me Mexican authorities, Mexican government officials, they have insisted that the new legislation is coherent with the USMCA because energy is not a part or not an integral part of the USMCA. And they like to quote Article 8 of the, of the USMCA, which is uh, entitled uh, the recognition of Mexico's sovereignty over its hydrocarbons. And Article 8 has two paragraphs. The first one says that indeed Mexico is able to change its legal framework or even its constitution uh, regarding the energy, the, the hydrocarbon sector. But it also has a second paragraph that establishes that the US and Canada, they maintain all the rights and they maintain the right to, to, this, to, to send Mexico to a panel if they uh, feel that the rights, the, the rightful, uh, uh, the, the rights in, in the energy sector have been violated. And this is the case with the, with the recent changes to Mexico's uh, legal framework on the energy sector. And also the uh, chapter eight of, of the USMCA, it talks only about oil and gas. It doesn't even mention electricity. And how is it that electricity is an integral part of, of the USMCA? It's very interesting because it's, it is through cross references. And I'm just going to briefly summarize some of the main uh, violations of of the USMCA through the new electric industry law. First of all, we have the chapter 22nd, which is says state-owned enterprises and designated monopolies, which is crystal clear when it establishes that there has to be an independent regulator that it should not uh, unduly benefit a state participant uh, against uh, private participants. But also, the, and this, people are not discussing this as I think they should, the environmental chapter of the USMCA, unlike NAFTA, NAFTA had an environmental side agreement, which was not really enforceable. 
but the USMCA has an environmental chapter and they, this chapter is enforceable because you have to demonstrate that a systemic violation of the one of the parties domestic legislation is uh, affecting trade and investment. And we can make the argument that, okay, the Mexican government has changed it. It has amended the electric industry law. However, it has not amended the climate change law nor the energy transition law. So Mexico is or will be violating its domestic legislation on environment and the risk of, of being subject to a panel to defend the energy policy because of violations on the environmental side is real. And furthermore, of course, we have the, the investment chapter, which was somehow diluted from NAFTA to USMCA. However, the, the Mexico and the United States in the Annex 14D, they maintain a, an, an ISDS, an, an, an investor state a dispute settlement mechanism, which covers three, um, three violations, uh, most favored nation treatment, national treatment, and direct expropriation. But also they keep all the, all the other protections, including indirect expropriation, which uh, an indirect expropriation is when a, a party changes the regulatory framework in such a way that it makes the operation of assets unfeasible, inviable. And that, that argument can be made for the electricity sector. And it happens to be that the electricity sector is one of the six cover sectors for, for these uh, broader prote protections. The others being, uh, for example, telecommunications, infrastructure, oil and gas. So Mexico, the risk of Mexico being subject to an ISDS panel is very real, or to a state-state dispute settlement, which is also, uh, unlike NAFTA, now it's easier to, to bring a party to an international panel because under NAFTA's provision, parties have the possibility of blocking panelists. And if you block a panel, it's, it's impossible for the panel to, to, to take place. Now it's not possible anymore. So now uh, the USMC ha has more teeth to, to, the, to consolidate the, the liberalization of the energy sector. And probably the most, uh, uh, the strongest protection to the openness in the electricity sector is a very, a very strange article, which is article 3211, which establishes that regarding uh, transnational services uh, and state-owned enterprises and investment, Mexico is going to give the same level of openness it gives to other countries or other parties with whom the country has a, a ratified FTA. Why was this? Why is this wording like that? Well, because by the time the USMCA was enacted last year. The CPTPP or TPP 11 or TPP, however you want to call it, it was already ratified. And the energy sector, both oil and gas and electricity, is fully consolidated. It is an integral part of CPTPP. And furthermore, Mexico is pending to, to sign and to ratify its, the, the modernization of the trade pillar of the global agreement between Mexico and the European Union where again, uh, energy is consolidated, the independence of the regulator is consolidated. And for example, regarding the independence of the regulator, nobody would say right now that the Energy Regulatory Commission is an independent body, that's not realistic. So Mexico is opening unnecessary fronts in the international arena, especially with the US, but also in Asia Pacific and also with Europe due to its, its energy policy. And it is likely that it will have to, to defend it. We'll see what happens, as Miriam was saying, in the judiciary now that the, the law has been subject of temporary and definitive stays. Let's see how what happens with injunction. Let's see what happens in the Supreme Court. But even if the, if the law made it through the Mexican judiciary, it will still face an uphill battle in the international arena. So, and I, I think I will leave it here because I already extended a little bit. So thank you. No, that, that's great, uh, Oscar. I think uh, that gives us a very uh, interesting perspective on the international challenges that this uh, new legislation might face. Uh, and we will uh, later discuss what, what will be the domestic judicial challenges um, uh, with, uh, with Miriam. If any uh, of uh, uh, the audience uh, wants to make questions, please uh, uh, write them in the Q&A section uh, of the Zoom, and uh, we in a in a few minutes will uh, uh, incorporate some of your uh, questions uh, to the uh, discussion. 
I wanted to uh, to move on to uh, Juan uh, to uh, I mean uh, you presented uh, some very interesting uh, uh, academic uh, studies on on the uh, features of the of the energy reform. I wonder what is your opinion of the, sort of the on the economic from the economic perspective on some of the new uh, regulations, for example, the new dispatch order for gen uh, uh, generation technologies, the changes in the market for clean energy certificates, and the elimination of the auctions uh, for uh, renewables. What, what, is, uh, what are your thoughts there, Juan? Sure, Francisco. Well, let me start with this shift from a merit order dispatch to a so-called physical delivery dispatch that um, Miriam described. So um, after reading the, the new law, it, it seems to be based on the idea that CFE subsidizes private generators that may bid at a lower cost due to such subsidies, such as uh, generation back of support to renewable energy, fixed cost subsidies, or even decreased transmission access prices. Uh, so the Senair uh, est establishes that physical delivery dispatch solved this problem. Of course, opponents to a physical delivery dispatch argue that this rule is only a pretext to favor CFE in a, in a non-competitive way, such as the Federal Competition Commission and even the judges that have stopped the, the rule or the, the law, the new law. Uh, so it is claimed that this would result in high generation costs on, on average in Mexico, which would be reflected in higher electricity tariffs and corresponding subsidies. Um, Likewise, as Miriam was saying, it has been mentioned that the current reform to the electricity law is a measure of CFE to reinstate all generation plants based on fuel oil. So that, that, that is why it is also known as the fuel oil law. Um, and yes, redefining dispatch would potentially allow the dispatch of such an expensive and polluting energy source. So my view is that, you know, efficient price signals in the various sub markets in an electricity markets are crucial. The new artificial dispatch order, in my view, would actually jeopardize sequential equilibria in generation markets that are intertemporally differentiated, such as a spot one day ahead or long run capacity resource market. And also very importantly, I think that it would also affect nodal prices, the nodal pricing scheme that I was mentioning before. And it would send, this would send wrong signals for the development of supply and demand across the multinodal system, as well to transmission investment incentives and financial transmission rights. So my, my view is that trying to solve an issue related to CFE's cost allocation or distribution issues through affecting allocative efficient price signals is a policy mistake. It seems to come from a lack of understanding of basic concepts in economics such as allocative efficiency, productive efficiency, and distributive efficiency. Now, uh, very briefly talking about uh, clean energy certificates that in the new law, the idea is that they will be awarded not only to new renewable generators, but also to existing CFE generation. I also think that this is not a reasonable measure for an instrument that was designed to incentivize the development of new renewable energy in Mexico. I think it will also deteriorate the price signals coming from the uh, market for uh, clean energy certificates. And finally, uh, talking about the elimination of obligation of CFE's basic provider, basic, basic service provider to buy from auctions, uh, it is argued again that the auctions were designed with the sole purpose of ensuring high returns on investments for private generations and generators at the expense of CFE. This I think is a similar cost allocation problem, but in my view, the solution is not to eliminate auctions or the requirement that CFE buys energy in a cost efficient way. Auctions have actually reached record low prices in Mexico, below uh, 20 US dollars per megawatt hour, and are also broadly used internationally in various countries in Latin America, and even replicated in developed countries such as Germany that is in the process of substituting um, its feed-in tariff structure with an auction uh, structure. So this would be my general comments, Francisco. Great, Juan. 
Uh, Lourdes, Miriam put you a little bit on the on the spot uh, before and uh, uh, on sort of uh, understanding the logic uh, uh, with respect to the private sector. At, at, at the, one of the recent uh, Mañaneras uh, uh, sort of uh, press uh, conferences of uh, President López Obrador, he accused two of the largest uh, uh, firms in, in Mexico, Bimbo and uh, FEMSA, um, of receiving on first subsidies uh, on their electricity uh, billing, on their, their pricing, uh, which undermining uh, CFE's uh, finances. Can you explain uh, to us a little bit uh, that dispute uh, and why this is uh, relevant uh, uh, in terms of the, of the new law? Uh, sure. First of all, um, thank you, Miriam, for the, um, for the challenge. And I, I, I was, as I was listening to Juan, I was um, truly fascinated because um, I think what, what, you know, his explanations were very technical. And I think part of the problem we have is that most analysts and most people have spoken against uh, this uh, presidential initiative and now a law that has been passed through Congress have centered on either the economic or environmental implications of the new law or on the legality, constitutionality of the law. Uh, but I think what is missing and we, what we have missed, and I would put myself even in that, in that group, is that we need to have a political reading of the law. And in order to understand really where President Lopez Obrador wants to go. And so the first thing I would stress is this reform is politically and ideologically grounded. Uh, and I think if we look at what he's trying to do on the hydrocarbon side, it applies exactly the same way. It is going back to the revolutionary creed where energy sector is sovereignty and where we need to go back uh, to having monopolies. But the president is taking it even a step further because he wants to go into autarky. That is, Mexico has to be completely self-sufficient. So in this new scheme, there is no room for private participation either in the, on the hydrocarbon side or on the power side. And of course, if your views are, you know, if your design is politically grounded, well, issues such as economics, environment, or even legal matters, they don't matter. So we should look at this reform. And I think it's very important to look at the dispatch. If we look at the dispatch, and if I have the chance, I'll show you a, a graph. The way it is structured, we are, uh, they are proposing to uh, first dispatch hydro plants, which are very expensive and of course emit methane, then go through the old CFE plants, then go to the renewables, which are the cheapest plants uh, in Mexico, and then take on the combined cycles by the power sector, which are also cheaper than the generation from CFE. So who does this reform favor? Well, first of all, it favors the political allies of the president. And by dispatching the hydro plants first, it's not only the plants of CFE, everybody thought of, thought of CFE, but we need to recall that the Sindicato Mexicano de Electricistas, which was the Sindicato, the union that used to run Luz y Fuerza del Centro, got um, plants, got about 14 or 15 plants that were given to them to be, um, you know, in a comodato scheme. I don't know how to say comodato scheme in English, but basically they are to run these plants for the next 30 years. And most of these plants are hydro plants, uh, which have already been studied to be uh, improved so that they can even be, you know, increase their productivity. And this means that this, this union, which is also a strong political uh, ally of the president, will be getting you know, an income on a continuous basis. Then you have CFE, but we need to be very careful. When we talk to CFE in this case, we're really talking about granting greater power to Mr. Barlett and his group. And then the dispatch of the private, of the private generators in the way that it is structured, but many of them would go bankrupt, especially the, um, the hydro plants. The issue with Bimbo and with Oxo. Uh, has to do with grandfather rights. And first, you know, in the Mañanera, which, you know, the president has taken the time to talk about this for over two or three hours on the, over the past three or four days, uh, I would say the first thing I would say is I don't agree. There are no subsidies. 
but the government is presenting the auto abasto scheme, the self-supply scheme, which is previous to the energy reform. It comes from the opening that was allowed uh, from the change in the law in 1992 uh, in a very completely distorted way, filled with half truth and I would say even lies to convey the idea that it is an unjust arrangement that is rigging the system. So what is the arrangement? Well, first of all, we need to recall that Bimbo is the largest bakery in the world, which is a listed company and has sustainability obligations. And Oxo is, Oxo is the largest retail company in Latin America. Invested, they invested heavily in renewable energy plants through the Auto Basto scheme to make sure that they could have cheaper and cleaner electricity. The Energy Regulatory Commission granted them the permits. So it's not like they decided to do this on their own. I mean, they got permits uh, with the approval of CFE about interconnections. They built and paid for the power plant. So the power plants, the generators are, are private and they paid for all the infrastructure for the interconnection, including transmission line and power substations, which are all granted to CFE for free. Okay, because as I said at the beginning, transmission and distribution is in the hands of the state, even before the reform and during the reform. In return, what they got was an established fixed green transmission rate that is updated according to inflation. So now what the president is claiming is that they are being subsidized because they do not pay the electricity rate that they would pay if they bought the electricity from CFE. And he compares the rate that these companies pay with the highest consumption domestic consumers pay, which has a premium over the cost of generation. So I don't know if I'm being clear, but basically he compares the very competitive rate that these companies get from all the investments that they did and the scheme that was agreed previous to the energy reform to what a domestic high, high consumption domestic uh, uh, rate, which is higher than what the actual cost of the electricity is. So the government is trying to do either two things, either bring to the negotiating table the companies or generate political support to actually annul grandfather rights, which I believe, I'm not a lawyer and maybe Miriam can tell us about this, but I believe it is unconstitutional. And also it's something that I believe uh, goes against international treaties. And my final comment, I would like to say, we often talk in Mexico and even abroad about the implications for the USMCA of uh, this law. But I think it's important to take into account that most of the affected private producers are actually European producers. And um, European producers, of course, are also protected by the uh, free trade agreement between Mexico and the uh, European Union. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lourdes. Uh, so, uh, Miriam, can you uh, tell us a little bit of what the state of play in the judiciary, uh, you know, what the, the, what's going to happen with these uh, challenges and uh, what do you think in the end uh, uh, will happen uh, with the law or a potentially maybe we can discuss later a constitutional uh, reform in case this is blocked by the uh, judiciary? Your, your mic, Miriam. <laughs> Okay, here I go. Well, we've had a, a very interesting phenomenon going on with the judiciary ever since the challenges of the agreement. Uh, I must confess that, I, that, that, a, that a group of friends of mine and I actually filed a constitutional challenge against the agreement and we've been winning so far. We have a definite injunction until the, the final ruling comes up. So the judiciary has been in general very favorable to competition and to a right of a, to, and the right to a clean environment and, um, and health and technolo technological evolution. And with this law, the, the thing has re, the, had, the thing has um, the, the phenomenon has repeated itself, meaning it's the most of the constitutional challenges have been filed before the, the judiciary in charge of telecom and competition because they regard it as a competition issue. And the very interesting thing about the suits is that the companies argue in favor of the public good instead of their acquired rights by means of their permits and their, and their contracts. 
they actually have the same very similar wording to what what has what was filed in the in, in the agreements challenges by the NGOs. So companies are arguing like NGOs, which is a very interesting new, new phenomenon. Like they have a legitimate standing as 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 they represent the public good. And the more interesting thing about it is that 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 the judiciary has bought these arguments and the injunctions are not only for them, but they've been general injunctions. Whether this is valid or not, with, with this is, whether this is convenient or not, is a big discussion in the Mexican in the Mexican Bar Association, amongst lawyers, amongst our, ourselves, and um, we don't have nobody has a very definite um, answer to this because it's very delicate. What I do foresee is that the Supreme Court is going to draw the issue because it's a major national um, topic. Um, I spoke to a friend of mine and he says, an amparo is an amparo, leave the court alone. It, it already has enough work. Well, I don't think this is just an amparo, a constitutional challenge as we call it in Mexico. This is a, this is a an amparo, a constitutional, an, a constitutional challenge of the greatest relevance. We're talking about the future of Mexico. Now, when we speak about um, the electricity law, it, Lourdes is completely right. The, 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 the implications are, are more for European power generators, meaning Spain, Italy, France. But now we have a new hydrocarbons bill that's about to be voted in Congress and the pipelines are American and Canadian investments. So we're hitting the world uh, wide with these with these legal changes and one very interesting thing about this new law in terms of um, the litigation effect is that Manuel Bartlett about whom we've spoke very very little I think he's the hand that rocks the cradle not the president I think that the president trusts him entirely and I was a bureaucrat a long time ago about 21 or 22 years ago I think that Oscar was learning how to read and write <laughs> then. <laughs> very knowledgeable young man, but very young still. And I'm very envious. And, um, and, and Bartlett was already being a pain then. You know, he was challenging their permits. He was challenging the, the multiple service contracts. We had constant, you know, litigation coming from Bartlett. And here he comes again, and here he comes again, and he comes again. And back in the day, I remember I spoke to one of his advisors and I asked him, why does he do this when he knows he's going to lose? And he said, he doesn't want to win. He wants to harass. He wants to harass in order to renegotiate. He wants you to, to, to push you to the brink of exhaustion to the point where you will not be wanting to spend one more penny on lawyer's fees which is a bad, very, very bad news for me, but that's his plan, is bringing people to the brink of exhaustion where they will say, I cannot afford more litigation. This is taking way too long. And this is domestic litigation. If we talk about commercial arbitration, international arbitration, the lawyer fees and litigating costs go sky high. So he's doing it again because you read the text of the electric electricity law and says, well, I don't know if the justices are come are, have commitments with the president, with any justice that can see, that can read and write, can see the unconstitutional basis of the of, of the reform. There is no way it can it can pass the constitutional test. And now with a new hydrocarbons law, there's no way it can pass a constitutional test. So I say, whoa, he's doing it again. He's bringing people to the brink of exhaustion to renegotiate everything. And probably these laws will die in the, pre and, and the, will die in the process, but if we have a constitutional reform, there is no way to constitutionally challenge the constitution. And then, then we will have to appeal to God to save Mexico. Well, on the, on that uh, religious note uh, <laughs> uh let's uh, uh move to, to oscar oscar uh, of course uh, in your uh, think tank you study a lot uh, the wider implications of regulations on sort of the competitiveness of of uh, of mexico so i wonder 
what are your thoughts on how uh, the electricity law will impact Mexico's competitiveness and the sort of the wider impact on on investment uh, in the in the Mexican uh, uh, economy? I think we, we can divide the, the answer to that question into two pillars. The first one we have already more discussed the implications of the. The, the investment that is currently that, that exists that has already been a, that is already the assets are already operating in in the Mexican uh, power sector. We have to see the the, the the outcome of the legal battles in the in the judiciary, but probably they will be able to continue operating because, because as Miriam and Lourdes were saying, it's potentially the, the, the law will never be fully implemented because of the legal challenges, because of the clear uh, inconstitutionality of the law. And maybe uh, as Miriam was mentioning, it, it will end up in a, in, in a negotiation. Uh, I, I think of the pipeline negotiation two years ago when, when the Federal Electricity Commission, uh, they, they threatened to go on an arbitration panel against uh, the, 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 construction, the, the, the constructors of seven uh, pipelines that have been halted because of uh, uh, different issues, some social issues, some environmental issues. Uh, and in the end, they uh, negotiated a new agreement where the Mexican state uh, committed to pay six $6 billion extra because they extended the lifetime of those contracts. And in the end, it wasn't the most uh, brilliant negotiation for the Mexican state, but in the end, what happened was a negotiation. They never made it to the, to the arbitration panel in, in London or in Paris or in the United States. However, the, the, the second pillar of, of the answer is that is, is the opportunity cost because Mexico is sending the message that the, that the Mexican state is not willing to live up to, to its commitments. And I think that's the main, that's, that, that's the main threat of, of this, uh, both of the electric industry law and of the, hydro, hydro, uh, of the bill to reform the hydrocarbons law. And I think that's, that's the main threat because uh, 27 years ago, the great success of the original NAFTA was precisely that. It was the first time in Mexican history that the country committed to the rule of law in, in, the, in, in the sector of the economy related to foreign trade, say exports, foreign direct investment. It was the first time. Bob Solik, former USTR, uh, said in a, in a panel last week that Mexican negotiators back, back in the early 90s, they saw NAFTA as a mechanism to import US rule of law to a sector of the economy, which I fully agree with that. I think that's absolutely true. And that was the great success of NAFTA. And now this is the first time that both the executive branch of government and the legislative branch uh, in Congress, they shamelessly pass legislation that, that, violates, uh, that clearly violates both the Mexican constitution and the international commitments uh, as Lourdes uh, right, right, rightly said, not only at the North American level, but also uh, our commitments, our investment agreements with, with our European counterparts and with Asia Pacific. Sorry about that. I'm, I'm a very NAFTA centric person for some reason, but it's absolutely true that most investment in electricity generation is a uh, European and not uh, North American. But I think that's, that's a main challenge. And, that's, and, and also this is not the first time that this happens. That, uh, regarding a, a, a uncertainty to investors. The first time it was in October 2018 with the cancellation of Mexico City's new international airport. The second one happened more or less in 2019 or 2020 with the, with the cancellation of a, of a brewing factory, a brewing plant in, in, in Me Mexicali in, in, in the border between uh, Baja California and, and, and California, where after a a, a public consultation, which wasn't necessarily uh, the most transparent one, they decided to cancel an investment of, of, a, of a foreign brewer who, which has already invested quite some, uh, quite some cash in the, in the new plant. And this is, then we have the pipeline situation in, in more or less in, in May, June, 2019. And now we have this. So this all adds up to the, to the message that makes the Mexican state is not willing to live up to its commitments. And that's the main challenge. And by saying this, I'm not saying that nobody's ever going to invest one penny in Mexico, because that's not true. Investment will continue coming, but it will not live up to the, to the potential of Mexico as, an, as, an, as a destination for investment. Because first, we have the rule of law issue. And second, well, electricity is an indispensable, a sine qua non condition for productivity. 
if we want to be more productive in manufacturing that was uh, that has been the, the one of the great uh, pillars of Mexican competitiveness, we need a reliable source of energy. We need reliable electricity. Another example, uh, data servers. Mexico now cannot have data servers because we don't have a IT, the, the, the competitive IT infrastructure, and we have the electricity. Because if I'm going to install an IT server, I need a guarantee that the electric uh, supply will be perfect because th th they cannot live with, with even the minor uh, chance of, of a failure. And Mexico today cannot offer that. So we're, we're, we're limiting ourselves in our potential, in our attractiveness to the, towards investment, and in the kind of investment we can receive. There is this uh, very highly sophisticated uh, investment that Mexico cannot receive and will not receive because of these issues, because of the, of, of, of the huge harm this government has, uh, has conducted in the, in the electric industry. And as I was saying, this has implication of, implications overall in the, in the Mexican economy. And I saw one question in the chat uh, asking for the, country, for the country risk in Mexico. Yes, of course, this, 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 adding, this adds up to the, to the other decisions and all of this, of course, it impacts, and of course, it it increases the the, the country risk of Mexico, and that's that's probably the most uh, the saddest part of this story: the opportunity cost of of these decisions. Uh, great, Oscar, uh, uh, Miriam, you had a you have a, a point. Uh, don't forget to put your mic on. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm very adamant about turning it off because I'm in my ranch and of dogs and of donkeys and of cows and they make a lot of noise. So, <laughs> so I want to I want to free you from all my from from my little animal animal farm context. What whatever what, what, what I think that one aspect I think that cannot be stressed enough is a rule of law. I think that Mexico became what it is today out of a, a rule of law crisis. So I think that whatever decision we make should have the rule of law as basis. What the rule of law is or isn't is, is, is subject to debate. But I remember about five or six years ago when we, when we, we published a book with um, Steven Zamora and Tony Payan and Jose Ramon Cascosillo that was also part of a Baker Institute initiative. We did a book on the rule of law and energy. And I don't think our reflections were deep enough because the rule of law as a whole affects the industry. So I've had very deep discussions with friends saying, well, you know, um, what we, if we win these injunctions, um, it's fine. However, they might, they might be won. We want to save the industry first. And I said, we cannot have an industry without a rule of law. So we have to have very sound and very solid judicial rulings. And I think the only way we can have a very sound ruling is at the top, meaning the Supreme Court. We might like it, we might not like it, but the law is not something you necessarily have to like. If, if you don't like it, you lobby by the rules, so it'll be overturned. But Mexico has a very, has a very short-sighted and superficial vision of the rule of law. It's for the here and the now. And we have to start thinking about the rule of law for 40, 50, 60, or 100 years of projects. And that would be my, my comment. Great. And that, that gets me to uh, a point that, that Lourdes mentioned before, and you also, Miriam, you know, at, at, at the end, uh, the, the basis of all this is, is political. It's a political sort of a, a equilibrium that upholds or not the rule of law in this, uh, in this area. And uh, some of uh, the questions that we have received that about, you know, is the Supreme Court going to be upholding the, uh, sort of the, the rule of law? And uh, what happens, I mean, if this reversal of... Uh, uh, of the energy reform, you know, in terms of the future of Mexico, could it be that a new government wants to, you know, uh, sort of open back the sector, but are we going to have this pendulum like in many 
other countries in Latin America in, in which, you know, we move from, uh, by the way, I have your book back here, Miriam, on the, uh, on the, the, the La uh, Caverna al Mercado uh, on, uh, on the previous uh, reform. Uh, so are we gonna, um, uh, first of all, uh, uh, in terms of the politics of this, are we going to see? Uh, I, I guess this hinges a little bit on the on the elections in in, in June. But are we going to see uh, a, a reversal uh, at the constitutional uh, level uh, of, of these reforms uh, or, or the of the previous uh, uh, reforms? And moreover, this this uh, I think this this is a very important insight that some of you have have. Uh, Shared, which is, you know, governments have a lot of power to harass companies and to use all the tools uh, at their disposal to eventually use them as a leverage for renegotiating uh, deals and, and, and contracts. And, and, and as we know, in the, in the energy sector, because of the nature of the sector, the massive uh, sunk investments that these companies uh, uh, make, uh, you know, sometimes they decide uh, as... Uh, Miriam says that that it's not worth it to, to you know to do a, a permanent legal challenge because you know in the end you, you you're gonna even if you win you're gonna lose I mean it's sort of a, like an exit strategy right you 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 uh, if you fight with the government and and you know uh, uh, you're gonna end in the, in the in in a bad way so what would it mean for the future of the energy sector in Mexico if we you know if investors feel that simply Mexico is not uh, a country that that will uh, you know of whole long term uh, uh, agreements and will you know use and and the governments might use their power uh, to basically uh, you know uh, do what the, to force their their will on on investors after they have committed the, the investment. I, you know we hear uh, here in Houston a lot of questions on on this regard because most people expected that Mexico will be different. Uh, from other Latin American uh, countries because of the USMCA, because of the nature of the Mexican uh, uh, economy so integrated to the, uh, to the world. And uh, until recently, and Tony, of course, uh, has discussed this issue uh, before, uh, because, of course, Mexico had this uh, fragmented political system that sort of created checks and balances to the presidency. But apparently, uh, 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 not necessarily uh, anymore. So I know I, I put a lot of things on the table, but uh, who wants to uh, comment on, on on sort of the politics of this? Uh, Lourdes, please, and then Oscar. Um, yes, thank you, Francisco. Well, I think several things are going on that I, we should notice. The first one is that the president had vouched not to overturn the energy reform and to let it live until the, for the first three years of his administration. And it is a case that he presented this bill ahead of the three years, precisely as we were beginning to enter the electoral uh, uh, timetable in Mexico. So a lot of this, it's political in the sense that I explained, but also I think that the president is trying to rally around the flag and try to you know, sort of get these emotions of uh, defending the, the sovereignty of the nation around this oil thing with a backward look, with a backward look on, on the energy sector. And I think that the great damage has already been done. I don't know if there's going to be a constitutional change or not, because it depends on the numbers. It depends on the elections. Right now, he doesn't have what it needs to change the constitution. But I think in, in, in a lot of ways, the energy reform is already dead. And the reason I say that is because in order to, to have, you know, this reform uh, was really based on the rule of law as one of our key stones and building um, investors' confidence. And I think the investors' confidence is being undermined on a daily basis. It's been little things first, undermining the CRE, the Energy Regulatory Commission, then changing, you know, not giving permits, then doing this decree, that decree, then changing the law. It's a continuous. And I think um, people, people get tired of that. You know, maybe people will say, well, we're going to wait and see and we'll see what happens with this president. But I think, and, 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 and I like to answer a question that somebody asked about saying that he was wrong about his interpretation of the risk. You know, 
while I was uh, deputy, sec uh, deputy secretary for hydrocarbons and we were drafting the oil contracts and people would say, well, but what if Lopez Obrador wins and he wants to change the constitution? And I would say, it's very difficult to change the constitution in Mexico. And these are contracts that are, are constitutionally based, they're legally based, and you know there are all these protections. And now the thing is, everything is up in the air. So uh, I think we are, you know, if we look at this, if we want to be rational, we're not going to get the, the a clear answer. This is very much tossed in the air. Are we going to become a Brazil or are we going to become a Venezuela? And to, to be honest, I don't have the answer at this point in time. I think a lot of politics is going on, but the damage that has been done to Mexico in terms of moving forward in the energy transition, in terms of taking advantage of the fourth industrial revolution, taking advantage of the new energy policy in the US and what it means in terms of bringing investment to Mexico to develop the supply chain for clean energies. We are gonna miss all of that if the, if the president continues to go on the road that he's taking of giving uh, priority to two monopolies and putting all the emphasis on oil production. Thank you, Lourdes. Oscar, you wanted to comment. Yeah, I'm just going to add uh, two brief considerations. First of all, as Lourdes was saying, it is very hard in Mexico to, to change the constitution. And if we see the, the, the actions uh, of the current administration regarding the, the reversal of the energy reform, it, 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 has been a, it has followed an incrementalist logic. It began with administrative regulatory changes. Now we are at the, at the law level. But it's, I, I do believe that it's going to be very tough to bring it to the constitutional level because now he doesn't have the numbers and he won't have the numbers after the election because in the Senate and, and the next uh, election of the Senate, the next renewal of the Senate is in 2024. So it is very likely that he'll have the numbers. But I do, I, I do want to add the caveat that there is a clear electoral, political, electoral motivation in, in, this, uh, in these proposals, in these bills to, to, to both at the hydrocarbons and in the electricity. And I feel that a further consideration is that the person has feels that time is running out. When he won back in 2018, he declared that the, the first two years will be the, the establishment of the basis for the fourth transformation because the, in this grandiloquent uh, idea of, of in this historical perspective, you know, that, that he sees the fourth transformation after the independence, the revolution, the, the separation of church and state, and now we're living the fourth transformation. And I, I have the feeling that he, senses that time is running out and, and he has to, to accelerate the implementation of, of, of the changes he wants to promote, maybe also because it is not that clear that he'll retain uh, the numbers he has today in the, in the Chamber of Deputies. So uh, I, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens uh, on, on June the 6th in the, in the midterms, but I do believe that it's not so clear that he'll retain his majority and that may be one of the answers of why he's promoting these changes at this very moment. Yeah, I, I guess, I mean, we, we don't know what's going to happen in, in June 6th. It could go either either way. I've seen, I seen, seen different sort of uh, predictions uh, uh, about it, but no doubt that he, by doing it before the election, he, you know, gets, uh, uh, in case he, he doesn't get the majority he wants, uh, he gets things, uh, things done. Uh, so, Miriam, you wanted to comment. Yeah. Um, I'm going to speak in, in personally anecdotal terms, which I generally don't like, but I think one of the reasons why the energy um, reform is not as popular as it could be is that it hasn't delivered to, um, to liberal middle class and lower, and lower classes in Mexico, and every reform needs a social license to operate. I moved to the country before the pandemic. I spent a very little time in Mexico City. I live in a very small village in, in the state of Mexico, not in Mexico City. And we have power outages all the time. I mean, basically as I speak, I was, I was, I was trembling before because I didn't want a power outage and to embarrass myself by suddenly be gone. But we've had very stable service in the past seven days, so I said, no, no need to go back to Mexico City. I'll stay in my ranch. Well, even, even we have a webinar, but we have power. For the past five months, we had power outages. And this is due to CFE services. 
And we have power outages in the midst of a pandemic and people were, were actually looking for, for a place to plug their oxygen tanks and their oxygen concentrators. It was, it was, it was hell. It was hell. And we have no hospitals and we have no clinics. And the three of the doctors here died and we were in the dark to top it off. And we received service from the Tlacomulco power generation facility. And I happened to ask why we had so many power outages. And he very gingerly said, well, it's because you are not uh, a significant demand um, area. And so, well, isn't this the whole point of having a publicly owned, a state owned <laughs> company? Is that they won't go for the for the income, but for or for providing service to the people, and it was actually irate because he said, "Well, that's that could, that could be the argument of a private company is that in Villa del Carbon we have we don't have any uh, enough consumers for it to be profitable, but we have a national power company precisely for that, so that we'll have universal service." So development in a, in a village like mine is a, is a completely irrelevant term, completely irrelevant. And I, and, and I mentioned my little town because it's representative of maybe 75% or 80% of Mexico. So in as much as you don't provide meaning to the word development, no formula, no formula will work because well, people will be unhappy. And one of the reasons people are unhappy is because the energy reform didn't provide a, a better solution for them. And I'll stop right here because we're running out of time. Oh yeah. no. Uh, uh, Juan and, and Lourdes want to talk uh, something. Since we will be wrapping up, I just wanted to add something to the mix. If anyone uh, wants to comment, uh, Juan or Lourdes or uh, Miriam or, or Oscar, which is some uh, questions that have been asked about the uh, gas side or sort of the, the and uh, that uh, uh, it has to do first with the with a new uh, bill that was presented on the hydrocarbons uh, law and sort of the potential for uh, uh, for example uh, restrictions on imported gas in case Mexico uh, produces gas there, there was a question on that so on the uh, of course power and, and gas are very much related so if anyone wants to add a comment to that uh, uh, um, it, it will be great Uh, so I will. This will be sort of the the closing uh, remarks. Uh, so let's start with uh, uh, Juan and then Lourdes and then if Oscar and Miran want to, uh, Juan, please. Yes, Francisco. We are running out of time, so I will be very, very brief. Um, firstly, I, I would like to, you know, I, I work in uh, theoretical economics, applied theory, and I mean, if someone came up with a problem that I should solve in, in order to you know, close back a, a system that was opened up or partially opened up and close it back to a vertical integrated monopoly again. I would not do what they are doing. They are just creating a mess of something that was more or less opened up, but now they are, you know, it's not completely closing, it's just changing some things and they are completely creating a mess of all the market logics in all this of markets in the system. So we would be, I think, as Miriam was saying, we, we would end up in a, something even worse than we were before, before the opening. So that, that would be my, my, my uh, initial reaction to, to that. And regarding yeah, the, the importance of, you know, the correlation between uh, the development of the natural gas pipeline system and the electricity market, I think that Texas Uh, polar vortex problem showed us how important it is to have that kind of coordination. So, so if we are also going to, to make a mess of the, the natural gas pipeline market system in Mexico, then, I mean, I add another mess to the already mess that they are creating. <laughs> On that ominous uh, comment, uh, Lourdes, thank you, Juan. L Lourdes. Yes, um, thank you. Um, I like to address um, uh, what Miriam's comment on uh, the, the, so, the social benefits of the reform. And I would say that I think many of the criticisms regarding these issues are really unfair because what people, and, and President does this very, very well, people uh, claim that there were no benefits of the reform, but the thing is we need to understand that the reform was approved at the constitutional level in December, 2013. 
uh, the laws were approved in August 2014. Implementation began thereafter with the design of the market. So we started having auctions in electricity auctions in 2016. We're talking of a really, you know, very brief period of time in which we actually did see a lot of progress. There were six billion US dollars invested in, in new uh, power plants, especially in the renewable sector, with the obligation to have uh, indigenous consultation, with the obligation to have social impact studies and ensure that there were real benefits for the communities. And moreover, there is one thing that I'm really concerned about with the new dispatch and the changes in the electricity market, which is the operation of the electricity market ensured that there were, a, there were revenues that were going into a fund to ensure uh, electricity coverage for those who do not have electricity coverage in Mexico. And during the short period of time that this was implemented during the Peña Nieto administration, the um, coverage went from 97% to 99%. So I think it's very important that we get 100% coverage because 99%, that means that there is at least 1.2 million people in Mexico who do not have access to electricity. But I think we really need to see how the system was working. And one of the things that I do regret a lot about the approach that this uh, government is taking regarding the energy reform is that they were going to be the great benefiters of this reform. They were going to be the ones that by 2024 will be seeing increases in oil and gas production. They were going to see improvements in terms of energy security and diversification of the, of the electricity mix. And they were going to be finally seeing real decreases in, in real terms of uh, electricity rates and of uh, refined products because we had created a market. I'm not saying that there were not things that needed to be improved, certainly they were, but there were a lot of elements that would be helping this administration, including the local content requirements that were included in the law. And with all these investments, we would be seeing the generation of good quality uh, employments in Mexico. What we are seeing is a lot of young people who decided to go into the energy sector, especially in the renewable area, that studied so, uh, sustainable engineering, renewable engineering that now have questions about their future. People who were given um, um, scholarships to study abroad, who now are coming back to Mexico and they're wondering what they're going to do. So. I think, you know, we really need to be objective about the evaluation that we do, we give this, this reform. And unfortunately, I think the future doesn't look, uh, doesn't, doesn't look great. Thanks. We, we have run out of time, but uh, uh, just a very brief uh, comment by Miriam and Oscar, I will give you the last word uh, if you want to say something. Miriam, very brief, please. Uh, put your uh, mic on. Thanks for reminding me about the mic. Um, Lourdes, what you say is perfectly true, but my neighbors here in this village wouldn't understand you. It means nothing to them. And the, and the difference between what you say and, Lope, and what Lopez Obrador says is that they understand him. And that's what they vote for him. So the problem is not in the, tru is, is not in the truth, it's, it's in the contents of the message. If you deliver the message, people will start supporting the reform. If you don't deliver the message, people will be indifferent or will vote for Lopez Obrador. Well, that seems to be a problem that we're having in many, not, not only in Mexico, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but elsewhere. Thank you, Miriam. So Oscar, very brief because we have to finish. Very briefly, I'm just going to say that I fully agree with Miriam and we have failed to deliver the message. We have failed to deliver to build a, a narrative of the benefits of the reform because, and I can say that from, from my personal experience, my day to day, my day job is to, 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 to analyze uh, energy policy. And I have, I, I was right in my stuff thinking if I had Manuel Bartlett or Rocio Nali in front of me, and if they are going to read me, and it's like finding the, talk, the right tone to talk to them. And I must say I have, I have failed there because it's, it's really tough to say, to sell that message. And we are, we're the Mexican Institute for Competitiveness. We talk about rule of law and competitiveness and the economy and the environment, but they really don't care about that. And, and in order to deliver the message to a wider audience, that's not the tone we, we should use. And it's, it has been a trial and error process, but we are still looking for that tone, for that right uh, message to socialize the benefits that Lourdes was very rightly uh, listing. 
Thank you very much. We have had a, a, a great panel. I have enjoyed it very much. And uh, of course, this uh, discussion will be ongoing. We, we uh, probably will have to now do a, a one about hydrocarbons uh, pretty soon. Or, and I'm sure Tony will uh, organize some event on, uh, on the midterm elections and what it means for the future of Mexico. So thank you very much, everybody, and hope to see you soon. Bye.